This is the Alta Fellows reading. Um, each year, between four and six thousand dollar fellowships are awarded to emerging translators, meaning either unpublished or minimally published, to help them pay their hotel and travel expenses to this conference. This is an extremely competitive uh, process, um, and in you'll see in the front of your program bios of all these six that were chosen this year. That's why we're, we only have an hour for six people to read, which is why I'm being such a stickler for time. Um, please read their bios. These are phenomenal new translators. We're very, very lucky to have them here. I, I'm very glad I'm not a young translator because I would have no chance at this point if I were to compete with any of them. Um, the Alta Travel Fellowship is funded by a combination of member dues and private donations, and we are just very grateful that we're able to come up with this money each year and, and have these uh, young people read for us and be our fellows. Are there any former fellows in the audience? Okay, so this is, I, I know, there, and I know there are more here at the conference who may have not trickled in yet. Well, we're very glad to have them part. Obviously, this is a wonderful way for Alta to grow as an organization. So please read the bios. I'm going to um, let them take, take over the reading, and I will ask Annie to begin. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you, Marianne, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Annie Tucker, and I translate from Indonesian. And I can't help wanting to say I've seen in the materials it as um, Bahasa Indonesian. It's either Bahasa Indonesia or Indonesian. So just since I'm sort of an ambassador, I wanted to put that out there. So now I'll begin. Eka Kurniawan is a young writer from West Java who has published three novels, three collections of short stories, and one work of literary criticism. This evening, I'm going to share the opening passage of Eka's first novel, Chantik Itu Luka, or Beauty is a Wound. Upon its publication in 2002, Beauty is a Wound elicited critical praise, a wide popular readership, and with depictions of mass killing, rape, insanity, and bestiality, stirred up a fair amount of controversy as well. It also introduced Eka's signature style, which is influenced by Sundanese myth and legend, Indonesian pulp horror, and the magical realism of Marquez and Rushdi. This combination contributes to a voice that is at once both highly original and emblematic of post-New Order Indonesian literature, which over the past decade has swelled with gleeful experimentation and roiled with acerbic socio-political critique. The novel's opening illustrates the style and voice while introducing the main character, a self-possessed Dutch-Indonesian prostitute named Dewi Ayu. In hearing it, I hope you will get a taste of Eka's vibrant and dark fairy tale Indonesia and why his work has come to be described by readers in his country as an insolence to be proud of. In Bahasa Indonesia, the opening of the novel reads, Sore hari di akhir bulan Maret, Dewi Ayu bangkit dari kuburan setelah 21 tahun kematian. Seorang bocah gembala dibuat bangun dari tidur siang di bawah pohon Kamboja, kencing di celana pendeknya sebelum melolong, dan keempat dombanya lari di antara batu dan kayu nisan tanpa arah bagaikan seekor macan dilemparkan ke tengah mereka. It's just getting started. <laughs> One afternoon on a weekend in May, Dewi Ayu rose from her grave after being dead for 21 years. 
A shepherd boy, awakened from his nap under a frangy panty tree, peed in his shorts and screamed, and his four sheep ran off haphazardly in between stones and wooden grave markers as if a tiger had been thrown into their midst. It all started with a noise coming from an old grave with an unmarked tombstone covered in knee-high grass, but everybody knew it was Dewi Ayu's grave. She had passed away at 52, rose again after being dead for 21 years, and from that point forward, nobody knew exactly how to calculate her age. <laughs> People from the surrounding village rushed to the grave when the shepherd boy told them what had happened. They gathered behind cherry shrubs and jatropha trees and in the surrounding banana orchards while rolling up the edges of their sarongs, carrying children and clutching broomsticks stained with mud from the fields. No one dared get too close. They just listened to the uproar coming from that old grave as if they were gathered around the medicine peddler who hawked his goods in front of the market every Monday morning. The crowd wholly enjoyed the spectacle, not caring that such a horror would have terrified each of them had they been all alone. They were even expecting some kind of miracle and not just a noisy old tomb, because the woman buried inside that plot of earth had been a prostitute for the Japanese during the war, and the Kiai always said that people tainted with sin were sure to be punished in the grave. The sound must be coming from the whip of a tormenting angel, and so they were bored, hoping for some other small marvel. When it came, it came in the most fantastical form. The grave shook and fractured, and the ground exploded as if being detonated from underneath, triggering a small earthquake and a windstorm that sent grass and headstones flying. And behind the dirt that rained down like a curtain, the figure of an old woman stood, looking annoyed and stiff, still wrapped in a shroud as if she had only just been buried the night before. The people grew hysterical and ran away even more chaotically than the flock of sheep, as their synchrony screamed echoed against the walls of the faraway hills. A woman tossed her baby into the bushes, and a father comfortingly cradled a banana stalk. Two men plunged into a ditch, others fell unconscious at the side of the road, and still others ran for 15 kilometers straight without stopping. Witnessing all of this, Dewi Ayu only coughed a little and cleared her throat, fascinated to find herself in the middle of a graveyard. She had already removed the two highest knots on her burial shroud and now untied the two lowest ones by her feet to free them so she could walk. Her hair had grown magically so that when she shook it loose from the calico wrap, it fluttered in the afternoon breeze, swept the ground, and shimmered like black lichen in a riverbed. Her face was gleaming white, even though her skin was wrinkled, with eyes that came alive inside their sockets to stare at the people gathered behind the shrubs before half of them ran away and the other half of them fainted. She complained to no one in particular that the people were evil to have buried her alive. The first thing she thought of was her baby, who of course was no longer a baby. 21 years ago, she had died 12 days after giving birth to a hideous baby girl. So hideous that the midwife assisting her couldn't be sure whether it really was a baby and thought that maybe it was a pile of shit, <laughs> since the holes where a baby comes out and where shit comes out are only two centimeters apart. <laughs> but this baby squirmed and smiled, and finally the midwife believed that it really was a human being and told the mother, who was lying weakly across her bed with no apparent interest in her offspring, that the baby was born healthy and seemed friendly. <laughs> it's a girl, right? asked Dewi Ayu. Yes, said the midwife, just like the three before her. Four daughters, all of them beautiful. I should open my own whorehouse, said Dewi Ayu, in a tone of complete annoyance. Tell me, how pretty is this youngest one? The baby wrapped up tight in a swaddling cloth began to squirm and cry in the midwife's arms. A servant was coming in and out of the room, taking away the dirty cloths full of blood and getting rid of the placenta, 
And for a moment, the midwife did not answer because there was no way she was going to say that a baby who looked like a pile of black shit was pretty. <laughs> Trying to ignore the question, she said, you're already an old woman, so I don't think you'll be able to nurse. That's true. I've been used up by the three previous kids and hundreds of men, 172 men. The oldest one was 90, and the youngest one was 12, just one week after his circumcision. I remember all of them well. The baby cried again. The midwife said she had to find breast milk for the little one. If there was none to be had, she would have to look for cow's milk, or dog's milk, or maybe even rat's milk. Yes, go, said Dewey Ayu. Poor unfortunate little girl, the midwife murmured, gazing down at the baby's upsetting face. She couldn't quite describe it, but she thought it looked like a cursed monster from hell. Its entire body was jet black, as if it had burned alive, with a bizarre and unrecognizable form. For example, she wasn't sure whether the baby's nose was a nose because it looked more like an electrical outlet than any other nose she'd ever seen in her entire life. And the baby's mouth reminded her of a piggy bank slot, and her ears looked like pot handles. She was sure that there was no creature on earth more hideous than this wretched little one, and if she were God, she would probably kill the baby at once rather than let it live. The world would abuse her without mercy. Poor baby, said the midwife again, before going to look for someone to nurse her. Yeah, poor baby, said Dewi Ayu, tossing and turning in her bed. I already did everything I could to try to kill you. I should have swallowed a grenade and exploded it inside my stomach. Oh, wretched little one, just like evildoers, the wretched don't die easy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tenzin Dickey, and I am uh, reading the poetry of two young Tibetan writers from Tibet. The first is Sakyal Sheta, a poet and an essayist from the town of Rebgong in northeastern Tibet. Sakyal Sheta is a member of the third generation, a new group of Tibetan poets and writers constituting a new literary movement centered around the border town of Siling, Xining in Qinghai, um, at the very edge of the Tibetan plateau. These writers write primarily in Tibetan as opposed to Chinese. Sakil published his first piece in a literary magazine run by the local monastery, and since then he has published his work in uh, all four of the third generation anthologies of contemporary Tibetan writing. Sakil Sira's poem, Repkong, was published in March 2013 on the popular and prestigious online journal, Gendun Chumpel. The poem is an ode to the poet's hometown, Repgong, which is a hollowed place in the Tibetan consciousness. It has produced many of Tibet's most famous writers and scholars, and is known for being a literary and intellectual cradle. This poem is a celebration and assertion of, and also mourning for, Tibetan identity and culture and history. Repgong. Hlasang Tongro, Chudong Buro. Kerang machine sangting ngom pusik, kerang dumane ladung nak pusik, rap gong a, payi rusi jing, mai sung torwe, logu gil lakar mukpo ang. Rap gong, burn the offering of incense, blow the dharma conch. You are a blue altar for incense. You are a dark fairy tale from long ago. O oh, Repkong, black fort of history, where my father's bones decayed, my mother's vital spirit scattered. Sometimes you are like the cool breeze streaming through the high mountains, sometimes like the clear water sluicing through the low valley. Precious to the king's heart like its heart blood boiling is the glittering Rongwo Monastery, a black tent resplendent amid blue grass, or a line of young wild yaks on mountain crags. O oh, Repkong, fatherland, famed Repkong of history where the dust has not yet settled. You are a song to sing, a dance to dance, where the poor dream joyful dreams, the rich display color turquoise and corals, and the lonely down their drinks in one shot. Every morning and every evening, the Red Valley is wreathed in a belt of smoke, 
like the chest of a freshly slain yak as the smoke rises, curling into air. Where there is cause and effect, whatever the season or the time of day, when I bind my pain and gaze at it, you leap at times into the sky, an eagle, at times fall into the water like an autumn leaf. This may be the sinful karma of your unhappy deed, the divining sign that your soul stone will disintegrate. Like a camel in the desert, an exiled people has no traces of their journeys and sufferings. Repkong, a land from which the young wish to leave, to which the old wish to return. Burn the offering of incense. Blow the tharma conch. You are a blue altar for incense. You are a dark fairy tale from long ago. The second poet is called Ngarma. He is a young and emerging poet from Amdo, northeastern Tibet also. This poem was published in Gendan Chumpel in 2011. Ngarma is also a composer of the lyrics for the song New Generation by the Tibetan rock band Yunduk, which has become an anthem for Tibetan youth in both Tibet and in the exiled diaspora across the world. Ngarma is the pen name of the poet Jigshal Kep. Tibetan writers usually use pen names. And the word Ngarma means anger. Gepe Thatawa. Polo nyer sum le mimbe ngala ke nang rirab dawa shik chung. Di jie nam, jie nam. Ngai gomo le yu tik zam dren du bu. Sadu ki yu lang te te ru cho. Chang ngar ne tuk sin. Kyak sin ba mang bu shik lar yang tre dab me bada. The present of the past. Only 23 in a mountain range of regret. What is this? What is this? From the door, I invite a drop of light. Dust particles assemble here. The tea has long grown cold. Much that has cooled cannot be warmed again. All these various incomplete drawings can't be erased. I can't forget unfinished works. Breaking the three unbroken arrows on my clock, I disarranged the 12 numbered hours. In the morning, hid from myself wrinkles on my forehead. A vehicle drags a tail of black smoke, rushes east at dawn, and returns west at night. Near the highway, I see a couple kissing happily. I see in my mind not my past, but their future. Only dreams plumb the mind's depths. The forgetful mind makes me feather light. One day, as you see me flying, that's an illusion. But another carrying me, that's real. My hair fell and grew. My eyes popped out of the dark. As the thorn bird loves the thorn, so I love the world. My steps grow smaller, my body bends. One by one, I forget names inked in the letters sleeping in this desk facing me. Those brought away by guardians of the dead must be dead. I have received no response from my friends. In another place, at another time, in a smoke-filled bar, they ponder country and neighbor, regret my late arrival. The darkness is like closely laid black bricks. I recognize everywhere as my home. And in my home, there is no fire even in winter, no flowers even in summer. Various objects in the distance burn in the distance. Images I can see have their essence. So do my birth, growth, sickness, and death, an essence that is interlinked. How do they connect smells and sounds that can't be touched, that collapse and scatter, and the root of my soul scattering? How do they connect my soul and clouds that glide overhead? The owl swooping in the armpit of night lands on wingtips of white light. This town is the inner heart of chaos. I have spent my days and nights on its streets and shops and bookstores. With an old key from my front pocket, I open an old door, lay on an old bed, dreaming old dreams. The news is today's, but I feel like yesterday. Right now, even an hour is a single rosary bead refusing to move. Rolling my thumb is all the duty I can manage. Just now, there can be an afterlife, or 
there can be no afterlife. Thank you. Good evening. First, I just wanted to say how honored I am to be here with you all. Um, tonight, I'll be reading. Oh, I'm Meg Brickbean, and I translate from the Catalan and Spanish. Um, and tonight, I'll be reading from Yusia Aramis's short story cycle, The Port. Yusia Aramis was born in Mallorca in 1977 and moved to Barcelona at 18 to study journalism, which she now regrets. Um, Ramis is currently a columnist for El Mundo, Time Out, and El Periódico. Among her own published avoir figure three novels, the second of which, Ego Surfing, won the Jusa Pla Award in 2010. Her latest project, um, All That Died Among the Bicycles That Day, has been held as one of the most powerful generational stories to emerge from the Spanish crisis. Although all of Ramis's fiction strives to draw out that sense of dislocation provoked upon returning home, a place that, for Ramis, straddles both Spanish and Balearic cultures, the stories within this collection seem especially disconcerting. But I'll leave that up to you to decide. El port. Uh. Record un erisol de barat per las farmigas. El trabarem prop de casa i volgarem alimentar-lo amb llet de tetra brick. L'endemà de matí era mort. Record que el meu germà va voler tastar una farmiga perquè els xinesos les mengen i se l'endugué a la boca quan encara era viva i escopí perquè coïa. Record que la meva cosina va treure un pneumàtic de l'embarcador i que em va botar un cranc i la meva cosina s'espantà i deixa caur la roda que esclafà el cranc que va treure el budeix per la boca. That'll make sense in a second. <laughs> the port. I remember a hedgehog devoured by ants. We found it near the house and wanted to feed it milk from the tel tetra brick carton. It was dead by morning. I remember my brother wanted to taste an ant because the Chinese eat them. So he popped it in his mouth while it was still alive and spit it out because it stung. I remember my cousin pulled out a dock tire at the pier and that a crab jumped out. She got scared and let go and it crushed the crab. It pushed the guts right out through its mouth. <laughs> Afterward, we hurled the body into the water and watched it float. I remember the time I picked up a log and pinched a lizard hiding underneath. I could swear it cried out. We spent some time observing that detached tail, my cousin, brother, and I. I don't come here often, and these memories have nothing to do with nostalgia. Three. She caught me peeing standing up, with one leg on either side of the toilet. She asked, what are you doing? I answered, I'm in training. She wanted to know what for. I told her since I'd be a boy when I got older that I needed to prepare myself. My mom, Mumara, didn't understand a thing. I had to explain that when you're born a girl, you turn into a boy at 14. Just like if you're born a boy, your sex changes then too. She said no, her eyes as wide as saucers. What do you mean no? It isn't like that, she insisted. I thought she was just treating me like I was stupid, and I reminded her that my older cousin had been a boy before growing up. Mumara denied it. Your cousin has always been a woman. I got mad. How could she say otherwise with evidence like that? I remembered perfectly that my older cousin had been a boy and that his name was Joan. Mumara, astonished, laughed under her breath. But I noticed and to, demanded to know why she was laughing. What was so funny? Why did she want to trick me like this? 
what, what did she think? That I didn't remember? Or maybe she thought I was an idiot. She told me I couldn't say that word. Idiot, 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 I repeated. And afterward, I ran away so, so she couldn't spank me with the slipper. Five, we would play superheroes at recess. We tied our school smocks around our necks like capes and pretended we were 16 because then we could have boyfriends. We invented our own Prince Charmings, usually movie stars like Superman. Paula was really tall and clumsy, just hideous. She had a patch glued to one of the thick lenses of her glasses. Her hair was frizzy and gray and she had long fingernails. Her teeth small with gaps in between. She had a lisp. We called her the witch behind her back, but she was our friend. If she turned into a creature, she'd easily be a snake. One day she said she'd be the boy. Six. The man hit her accidentally. Afterward, he kept running without even acknowledging us. Shit, Begunita cried out, which embarrassed me a bit because we couldn't use that word at home. She suddenly realized that her hand was bleeding. I didn't know what to do. It grossed me out. She was crying from shock. To me, it was the dirty blood of dogs, of cats and fish in fur, chameleon or canary blood. It made me sick. A woman came over to see what had happened. She asked where Begunita's parents were, what insurance she had, things she couldn't answer. She said she'd take her to the emergency room. Begonitas kept asking me not to leave her all alone. At 11, I answered very seriously, no, I've got to go. My parents will get worried if I miss the bus. This woman will take care of you. And I left her like that, with another stranger. Seven, do you want to get married? Wrapped up in my legs, both of us lying on a bed of white sheets, sweaty and naked. It was summer then. He uses those words that so overwhelm me. I respond that the time for stupid questions is from 6 to 6.15 in the morning, and now he has to take me home. I remember his name, but I won't write it down just in case. Just in case in his written presence is still as resounding as the one in my memory of that night. I knew one day I would tell him yes. We'll never meet again. Eight. Yellow crates for hauling glass bottles. Our checkered butt sitting on those crates. Would you like some more coffee? We'd play house and I was always the guest. Yes, per favor. My knees fully bent, the hammocks are fort. Sometimes the dolls too, but we usually didn't play with dolls. And grandmother's biscuits. Nine. Is that a hand over there? It was my cousin who found it. We ran over to the rocks in flip-flops. The man reeked of fish and flies swarmed round his neck. His head was gone. I don't remember us screaming or running away or why we wanted to touch him with a stick. Nor do I remember who we went to tell him about or when. I only know that the police came because they told me so afterward and that I wet the bed that night. I was a big girl by then, already nine. Now it's my body that floats. Thank you. Hiya. I'm Alice Guthrie, and I translate from Arabic. So, the writer and academic Zahir Omarin was born in the Syrian city of Hama in 1985, just three years after the massacres of 25 to 35,000 people 
committed there by the Assad regime. That's Assad the father. You're about to hear an extract from a story called Milk, Halib in Arabic, taken from his forthcoming collection, Tales of the Orontz River, or Hikayat al-Asi. This book is not only the first ever literary work to openly address the massacres, but in another huge break with convention, the stories are written entirely in the local oral dialect rather than in formal standard Arabic, reflecting the way they've been handed down until now, orally. Here, as in each story in the collection, a parent is telling their child a tale from the events, the euphemism universally adopted until now in Syria to refer to the massacres. And in Arabic it begins, Eh, eh, Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's absolutely no one in the whole city she hasn't breastfed. Even your older brother, actually. She fed him when my milk dried up during the events. May she rest in peace. Is that why he used to call her Yamu when he was little? Yeah, exactly. We got him used to doing that when he was really small. And it would blow her mind when kids called her that. She loved it. And there were lots more like your brother, of course. In those days, ya Latif, there were so many tiny babies whose mothers had passed away in the events when they were still breastfeeding. Every time we found an orphaned baby who needed breastfeeding, we'd take it straight to Umm Mahmoud. And then, of course, there were all little babies whose mother's milk had dried up from shock and terror, like mine had. And Umm Mahmoud, my God, she was incredible. She was such a warm, motherly person that her breasts were like cream churns, swollen with this rich nourishment which somehow or other never dried up, luckily for all those children. Even though at the time she was probably getting on for 40, but ya Latif, what trouble and heartache that story brought to some of us later on. Why? What happened? What happened? All the families got mixed up. No one knew anymore whose child was whose. Or, like what happened with Ibn Sikha, ugh, it was such a terrible thing. What happened? I'm getting there, love. Hang on. When they raided Bain al Hayrain in 82, during the events, apparently there was no one left alive from that neighborhood to even tell the tale. Very late one night, the baker, Abu Khaldun, he was very well known in Hama back then, actually, because his bread was as fluffy and light as whipped cream. It was such great bread. Anyway, late one night, he heard someone knocking really loudly at his door. And in those days, you see, we all knew that a knock on the door in the night could only mean two things. We were either going to prison or going to be executed. So Abu Khaldun got himself up and quickly said goodbye to his kids and then to his wife. And he put on his sheepskin coat. It was bone-cracking cold out there. And he opened the door. And there, on the doorstep, he found a soldier standing in the bitter cold night with a tiny baby in his arms, still in its swaddling, chilled to the bone and crying its eyes out. With his eyes full of tears, the soldier put the baby into Abu Khaldun's arms and said, take this, it's all that's left of Bain al Hayrain." As Abu Khaldun, the baker, tells it himself, I took that baby and I tucked him in between my two children in their bed, and straight away he warmed up and fell asleep. I, I got back into bed with my wife, and I made a vow to God himself right there that this baby would be one of my own children. The next day there was a sudden raid on our neighborhood and they banged on the door, they were coming to get me. But then the soldier who'd brought me the baby that night recognized me and he spared me. By the grace of that child, I was saved. Well, that baby had, been, had still been breastfeeding when it lost its mother, so it needed milk. Om Khaldun threw herself at the problem with a passion, soaking tiny scraps of bread in water and trying to feed them to the little one. But he was only a newborn, 
He wasn't ready for solids at all. And before even a couple of days had passed, he started getting weak and ill, and he'd screamed so much he'd lost his voice. That baby was on the brink of death, basically. Abu Khaldun was absolutely losing it. He started rushing around, searching frantically for milk all over the city. But there literally wasn't a drop of milk to be had in all of Hamma right then. It wasn't milking season yet. It was February, and the sheep wouldn't produce any milk at all until the middle of March. And then Abu Khaldun heard that Umm Mahmoud was breastfeeding all those orphaned children. He picked up the baby at once, and he rushed over to her place. Umm Mahmoud says that when she saw Ibn Sikka crying noiselessly like that, half dead, something happened inside her, and her milk just started gushing out like never before. In those days, I was constantly, t constantly taking your brother around to Umm Mahmoud's place, so she could feed him too. My God, I'll never forget what it was like, son. We were practically queuing up to get our babies fed. Her house wasn't big and we'd take her whatever God provided. One of us might have an egg for her, another brought some bread, maybe someone else brought some meat or a bit of veg. Because all of us were really up against it, you know, really struggling to feed our families. Yeah, yeah, what happened to Ibn Sikha then? Well, Ibn Sikha grew up into a boy and Abu Khaldun was his father, he'd adopted him. And he brought him up very well, educating him about religion and morality and good manners. He grew up into a young man with impeccable morals. Eventually, Abu Khaldun decided it was time to get him married. And so he got him engaged to this gorgeous girl, as pretty as the moon, called Fatima. I still remember her. Sure enough, they got married. Of course, Abu Khaldun had always really, really spoiled Ibn Sikha, like no one's ever been spoiled before or since. He used to say to the rest of his kids, if it wasn't for this boy, I wouldn't be here with you today. I owe him my life. The lavish, led, the lavish wedding he laid on for him was the talk of all Hamma. Um Mahmoud danced this incredible wild dance at the wedding, and she didn't cover her hair in front of, front of Ibn Sikha. She said, this is the one child who I've never forgotten feeding. When he latched on, my milk would come down in such torrents I could have fed all the babies in the city from both sides of the river, from al to al-Suq. And she worked her way around all the guests in turn, telling them, this is my son's wedding. So time passed and seasons changed and Fatima fell pregnant. But just two months into her pregnancy, she lost the baby, poor thing. She got pregnant again, and she miscarried again. There was a third mis miscarriage, then a fourth. The baby would die inside that poor woman's belly before two months were up, every time. Poor Fatima. Her mother had passed away by that point, and her father was a very old man. So the women of the neighborhood started to get really involved, and they went to great lengths to help her. What do you mean? Let me finish, son. You'll see. They were so thorough. They left no stone unturned in their search for an answer. And in the end, they worked out there was nothing wrong with the girl. She wasn't ill, but she too had been breastfed by Um Mahmoud during the events. Her mum's milk had dried up, just like mine had, because of everything that was going on. So it turned out that poor Ibn Sikha had married his milk sister, and that's why she couldn't reach full term on any of her pregnancies. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Novich. I've been translating the poet Izzet Sarailiyach from the Bosnian. Uh, Izzet Sarailiyach was born in what is now the Bosnian Serb Republic in 1930. At age 15, he moved to Sarajevo and remained there for the rest of his life. Much of his work is about his love for the city, which he considered his home. Sarailiyach published his first poems when he was 19 and went on to publish 30 books of poetry. He also worked as a journalist and translator, wrote numerous essays and memoirs, and was a professor at the University of Sarajevo. Though he is widely regarded as one of Bosnia's most famous poets, English translations of his work are few. 
Sarailich's poems, as I hope we'll come across here, are characterized by spare language and a dark, dry wit born out of the socialist aesthetic and what I like to call Slavic angst. Um, <laughs> the poems I'll read for you now are mostly all from the collection Sarajevska Radna Zbirka, which means Sarajevo War Journal, written in the first 30 days of the siege of Sarajevo in 1992 and published in 93 across the border in Slovenia. Of the book, he's quoted as saying, this is the only collection of which I can say I would have loved never to have written it. Um, he died in 2002. Sreća na Sarajevski način. U Sarajevu proljeća 1992. godine sve je moguće. Staneš u red za hljeb i završiš na traumatologiji sa odsjećenom nogom. Poslije toga još kažeš da si imao sreće. Luck, Sarajevo style. In Sarajevo, in the spring of 1992, anything is possible. You go and stand in a bread line and wind up in the trauma ward with an amputated leg. Afterwards, you still say that you were very lucky. After I was wounded. Last night, I dreamt Slobodan Markovic came and apologized for my wounds. It was the one and only Serbian apology this whole time, and even that was just in a dream and from a dead poet. Patriotism of a Yugoslav writer. A Yugoslav psychiatrist is successfully treating the mentally ill in Detroit. A Yugoslav violinist is first chair at the conservatory in Brussels. A Yugoslav mason raises new buildings in Stockholm. A Yugoslav painter is the best in contemporary French painting. The Yugoslav footballer is the best right wing back in the Bundesliga. From our temporary or permanent foreigners, one could assemble another little country abroad with representation from all trades, except for ours, literature. Connection between the mind and the body and the limitations of communication in general. Um, another part of the series was um, a novella about a young woman who smuggles in drugs from Mexico and works to assist terminally ill patients um, who wish to end their life. And this was originally published by him under the pseudonym Angela del Fabro. And the story inspired a movie that uh, it's called Miele, Honey in English, that um, was a, was shown at Cannes in 2013, I believe. Um, and this made it into, this became the second part of um, the last novel in his pentology, which is called A Nome Tuo, In Your Name. And I'll be reading an excerpt from the first part of the novel that I'm working on translating now. Um, for, so here's a paragraph in the original Italian. I know there's people in the audience who speak Italian, so no judgment, please. Okay. Uh, mia madre mi ha sempre assicurato che nonno Marcello non ha mai osato allungare le mani, ma qualche volta ho pensato fosse solo una bugia, una bugia a fin di bene. L'unico modo per impedire che mio padre gli si scagliasse contro, in fondo per proteggere entrambi. Mio nonno era un donaiolo recidevo, umiliando Nona Lisa, si era fatto odiare dal figlio. I rapporti tra i due erano difficili sin dall'inizio e sono peggiorati nel tempo. Per questo ogni tanto dubito della versione di mia madre. C'è quell'episodio, ad esempio. Okay. Let's go to the first page. Okay. My mother always assured me that Grandpa Marcello had never dared touch her, 
But there were times I thought this might be a lie, a white lie, the only way to stop my father from killing him, to protect them both in the end. My grandfather was a recidivist womanizer, which shamed Grandma Lisa, and his son hated him for it. Relations between the two had been difficult from the start, and they grew worse with time. Because of this, I sometimes doubted my mother's version of events. There was that one time, for instance. My mother and my grandfather are in a light blue Fiat 500. They're returning to Trieste from Zone B. It's a beautiful March morning. The year is 1965. I am the eight-month-old fetus growing in the young woman's belly, which, truth be told, is squeezed a bit too tight against the steering wheel. But she insists on driving. It's her car, and her faith in the old man only goes so far. In 1965, Trieste has been, an, has been Italian for 11 years, but the feeling of separation remains, a split that is still clear in place names, Zone A and Zone B, the city and its former eastern periphery, two slices of the same cake that were divided with one cut of the knife in the 1946 peace agreements, Zone A controlled by the Allied forces, Zone B controlled by Tito. In 1954, when Trieste officially joined the land of La Dolce Vita, the split between the two zones would also become the split between two worlds, capitalism and communism, the sky blue fiats of liberty and the rusting yugos of equality. But life, of course, is not lines on a map and the people of Trieste are still in the habit of making trips to Zone B. To this day, the place name remains in the local vocabulary to indicate what is now just a tiny, nondescript piece of Slovenia, a speck in the European Union packed with casinos and wellness centers. Many people at the time still owned small plots of land just across the border which had not yet been confiscated. Some continued to conduct business in the nearby port of Capodistria, but the vast majority of people went to Zone B to stock up on meat, cigarettes, and gasoline. And this is exactly what my mother and grandfather have done. There are 30 liters of diluted low-octane obichni benzene, that's normal gasoline, in the tank of our 500, a carton of filtered cigarettes under the driver's side floor mat, and two kilos of pre-cut steaks hidden beneath my grandfather's shirt. The customs officers wouldn't look under the seat of a pregnant woman, nor would they frisk an old pensioner. It was an admirable plan. In the back, in plain view, there was a bag of worthless little trinkets which sit ready for the question, anything to declare? It hurts the Italian gas stations and butchers. It's a betrayal of the land of La Dolce Vita. But who cares? Everything is cheaper there. And more importantly, we are Triestini, former subjects of the Habsburgs, former citizens of fascist Venezia Giulia, former inhabitants of the free territory of Trieste. Italy is far away. One didn't even need a passport to enter Zone B. All one needed was a laissez passe a document that embodied the mix of sensations I felt as a young boy on those excursions. It wasn't a real trip abroad, and yet I was crossing a border. I was entering a country where even the ice cream spoons were different. It was right around the corner, and yet a mustachioed guard needed to let us passe. After the border stop, I was struck by a sad uneasiness. I was home, but I wasn't home. They let me pass into that mysterious nation, and every time I'd wonder what it would be like to live there, to always eat ice cream with those strange little spoons that curled up at the end, to enter that gray building indicated by the triangular traffic sign with the mother holding her child by the hand, just like the ones where we lived, but with the word Shkola shouting from the bottom. Lokov, Kozina, Sejana, in a country like this, I wouldn't have been surprised if the Mad Hatter appeared. At any rate, on that day in March, I am not yet born. My mother is a 26-year-old factory worker on maternity leave with the profile in the chignon of Claudia Cardinale, and my grandfather is a pensioner who obligingly accompanies his daughter-in-law on some errands outside the house. He didn't hate her anymore, 
Obviously, he hated her at first. At first, she was just a stupid refugee. Stupid like all the other Eastrian refugees. Why would she run away from communism? Why reject the people's true liberation in order to slave away eight hours a day in a factory in Trieste? The Eastrians ranked right below the wafer eaters, Southerners, and Americans on my grandfather's list of personal prejudices. But the young woman had known how to quickly win him over. She'd listen patiently to his picaresque tales. She'd help her mother-in-law prepare Sunday dinner with delicious Eastrian subversions such as cavatelli with shrimp a la buzzara. And of course, she agreed to let him accompany her to zone B for the weekly shopping. For my mother, that man with the eye of a wolf on the prowl was just an old grumbler with whom she passed a few hours talking about American sluts and the tricks employed by dishonest waiters. Even my grandmother felt he was harmless now, to the point where often it was she who convinced her daughter-in-law to let him tag along so as to get him out of her hair for a bit. But how did my grandfather see himself? Did he see himself as a broken man when he looked in the mirror? After all, he was only 68 years old, with the broad shoulders of a young man and a receding hairline which rather than softening accentuated the sleazy air about him. Had he really managed to keep his hands off his son's wife? Then how does one explain his reaction that morning? The Fiat 500 stops in front of the Yugoslavian sentry post. One officer checks their laissez-passer. The other, standing a bit behind, looks at the two of them in the car. My mother doesn't know Slovenian, but she swears that they didn't say anything. Not a raised eyebrow, not even a quick parting of the lips. But my grandfather heard it. In the officer's tight lips and their vacant eyes, he saw the words that spoke his desire. Stari parsek joje na fil. The old goat knocked her up. Without a second's hesitation, he jumped out of the car and ran up to the sentry post, shouting in his mother tongue. In a scene whose symbolism was all too obvious, these quick movements made his shirt come untucked and the bag of meat fell to the ground. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think this wonderful group of readers needs another round of applause. <laughs>